uh, clever people call the first 18 verses of John's Gospel his prologue, and this is the last of four Sundays when we've been looking at his prologue together. Gosh, I wanted to get the word in twice, so there we go. Uh, The impending birth of a child in your family. Uh, Everyone is so excited. Uh, Will the child be delicate and fair and gentle like mum? Or will the child be big and butch and bovine like granny? Someone's going to tell me off afterwards. I know, I know they are. I know. We have been looking, we have been looking at John's Gospel just to see uh, if we can discover the essence of Christmas. This baby who was born in Bethlehem all those years ago, uh, what is he about? Uh, Let me very briefly remind you what we have learnt so far from John. Uh, You can see at top left-hand corner of the pew sheet. Uh, We've learnt that Jesus is more than I ever thought. Uh, Jesus was in the beginning. Uh, We began our lives at our conception, but Jesus, we've learnt, was around far beyond when he was conceived by Mary. Uh, he, is, he is the creator of the universe. He is the one who keeps the universe going. Jesus is more than I ever thought. Uh, we've learnt that God's gift is finer than I ever thought. Uh, the Bible tells us that the world really is a dark place. It is a darker place than we think. Uh, we were surprised and horrified by Paris last week. We were right to be horrified, but we were not right to be surprised. Uh, I think it is telling that we were rather less surprised by Marley this week. Uh, Evil surprises us more when it is close to home when it happens near to people like us. No, we're wrong to be surprised because this is what happens in a world that rejects its creator. Uh, And God's gift is not to put some bandage on the world. God's gift is to create a brand new world, a brand new heaven and a new earth where one day people who really do want to follow the Lord Jesus will live. And contrary to what some have been taught, heaven will not be the destination of those who put bombs on aeroplanes. Heaven will not be the destination of those who fire their guns into theatres and restaurants. The promise of unlimited sex with virgins in paradise to Islamic martyrs is a sick lie. God's gift is a new heaven and a new earth where anyone who has even a speck of intent to harm will be excluded. But that does present a problem for people like uh, you and me because no, uh, we are not in the habit of blowing people up but we are in the habit of blowing up at people. Uh, So far as evil is concerned, few of us are in the same league as the terrorist, but so far as goodness is concerned, none of us are in the same league as the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to be as pure and as spotless as him to enter the new heaven and the new earth. Otherwise, we would spoil the place and otherwise, very quickly, it would become like Mali or Syria or or Paris. And so a couple of weeks ago, we learned that God's generosity far exceeds what I deserve. 
the Lord Jesus has qualified those who want to receive him as king. He has given them the right to be adopted into his pure and holy family. On the cross, he took our impurity and swapped it for his purity. God's gift really is finer than I deserve. And so this morning, our final look at these opening chapters of John's Gospel. You can see my title at the top of the page there. Uh, I'm wanting us to gain a fresh glimpse of the one who has made all of this possible. The glory of the one and only Son. My first heading this morning, from near to here, the brilliant reality. John writes about the Lord Jesus, verse 14, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Let's look at that quite closely. The word became flesh. The Lord Jesus became a man and made his dwelling among us. Uh, More literally, that could be translated, and he pitched his tent among us. Uh, The Lord Jesus came to earth and pitched his tent next to ours. I just imagine, will you, Glastonbury or V-Fest or one of the big uh, music festivals? Uh, tens of thousands, I don't know how many go to Glastonbury, surely tens of thousands, I don't know if it's hundreds of thousands, anyway, lots and lots of people camping out, uh, this is England, so usually camping out in the, in, in the mud. Uh, my experience of camping at big events is that on day one, the loos are just about acceptable, but by day three, uh, and you're there, in your little pop-up tent. Uh, But the the international multi-millionaire megastar superstar who is the lead act on stage, where do they sleep? Well, where do they not sleep? They do not sleep in a pop-up tent next to yours. They do not queue for the same lose you queue for. Uh, At the very least, uh, the multi-millionaire superstars have these gold-plated motorhomes that they live in, uh, or probably, more likely, they have helicopters that fly them in and out to their five-star hotels, which are away from the crowds and away from the pop-up tents and the insanitary loos. Multi-millionaire megastars don't pitch their tent next to yours. Can you see what John is saying? The Lord Jesus Christ, the King of the universe, in being born in an animal's feeding trough, in being terrorised, not by Isis, but by Herod, from the day he was born, In being, yes, loved by some, but despised and rejected and hated by most. John is saying the Lord Jesus Christ is putting his pop-up tent next to us. Welcome to my world, we sometimes say to people when they experience what we experience. Jesus came to my world. But the people of God sort of knew this was coming, or rather, had they eyes to see, they would have known uh, this was coming. Uh, I don't know the exact date uh, the exodus out of Egypt happened, uh, maybe something like 1500 BC. Uh, That reading from Exodus that we had, I don't know if you noticed that something very similar happened there. Uh, Exodus is the second book of the Bible. Genesis is the first book. You remember the end of Genesis. Joseph is prime minister of Egypt. Uh, The Israelites were established in that land and they were multiplying and they were prospering. That's at the end of Genesis. And then there, there is a gap of something like 400 years and there is a new pharaoh. A new pharaoh comes to town and he hates God's people and he puts them into slavery. 
Uh, And the book of Exodus tells of God raising up Moses. And you remember those ten terrible plagues that were inflicted upon Pharaoh and Egypt? And how Moses helps the Israelites exit out of Egypt, exodus out of Egypt, and they go through the Red Sea. God leads his people, God guides his people, God provides for his people. God gives them a legal system so that they can safely live. I don't know the numbers, maybe two million people in the desert, two million Israelites. Uh, Where did they live? I don't know my history, but I can just about imagine that the Sinai Hilton had not quite been built at that period of time. So where did they live? Well, they lived in... they lived in tents. And quite extraordinarily, and John read to us about this, there was a special tent where, Moses the author of Exodus tells us, people could meet with God. And that tent was simply called the tent of meeting. Uh, And Exodus 34, uh, we're told that the Lord spoke to Moses there as one would speak to a friend. Uh, In that very same chapter, we're told that Moses says to God, show me something of your glory. Uh, And somehow God did. He showed the people something of his mercy and his compassion and his goodness. But significantly, God said to them, but you can't see my face. You, you, You can't see me full on because I'm too pure. I'm too holy. You wouldn't be able to stand it. I've just bought a, a, a new torch. Uh, And I'm really surprised at how powerful it is. Bulb technology and battery technology seems to have really gone at pace since I last bought a torch. It is really bright. And if I shone it in your eyes, you wouldn't be able to stand it. You wouldn't be able to bear it. You can't see me full on, says God. I'm too holy. I'm pure. I'm too too pure. You wouldn't be able to stand on it. Stand it. Exodus uh, 34, Uh, God came near to his people in the uh, tent of meeting. Uh, Later that arrangement became a little bit more formal uh, and there was something called the tabernacle, which was a more formal tent where God was said to be present. And still later in the Old Testament, Solomon builds his temple where God symbolically is present with his people. But see what we've got here, John chapter 1, verse 14. John tells us, not a tent of meeting, not a tabernacle, not a temple, but verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. God was no longer merely near, yes, close by, but quite unapproachable. No, now he is here, says John. My first heading from near to here, the brilliant reality. And secondly, from stone to flesh, the word that gives life. Uh, Exodus, we've been in Exodus 30-ish, Exodus chapter 10, a few chapters before, God rescued his people from the hell of slavery in Egypt, Uh, but then pretty much immediately he takes them to Mount Sinai, Uh, and Moses goes up the mountain, and God gives them his law, his commandments, Uh, ten commandments, but Behind each of them, there is much detail explaining what they look like in practice. What does John tell us? John tells us, verse 16, talking again of the Lord Jesus. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now, do we like laws and rules and regulations. (laughs) Possibly not sometimes, because we don't like being told what to do. 
Uh, I was coming up the M6 on Thursday. I was tired. I wanted to get home. And, oh joy, I came to a 50 limit. Uh, and even worse, there were signs everywhere promising me the presence of speed cameras. <laughs> but actually, we sort of know that law and order is good, don't we? We recognize that law and order is good because it keeps us safe. It keeps others safe. Just think back to God's people for a second. In slavery in Egypt, they were slaves. So the only laws that they were subject to were the laws barked out by their slave masters. The only slaves that they really experienced were those enforced by their captors' whips. But just imagine they're free now, aren't they? They are free from slavery. They have, they have no constraints whatsoever. So God very kindly says to them, this is the way to safely live. This is the way to live well. This is the way to be human. And, 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 and we know the commandments. Perhaps if I can briefly summarise five of them, they'll be very familiar to you. God says, live for me, I'm your God. Don't murder each other. Don't steal from each other. Delight in sex as it was designed to be enjoyed. Don't pervert it. Don't start envying other people because of what they've got. I took uh, the dog for a walk this week. Uh, someone had left food for their cat outside their front door and, and Truffle went straight for it. Because she has no morals. Dogs have no morals because they're not human. Wasn't God kind? Wasn't God gracious? Wasn't God generous? Wasn't he full of grace when not only did he rescue the people from slavery through Moses, but when he taught them what it means to act like human beings. How to live as humans, not how to live as dogs. But I'm sure you've noticed two massive limitations with the rescue of Moses and the law of Moses. Uh, the rescue from Egypt. What's the problem with the rescue of Egypt? What's the limitation of the rescue from Egypt? Well, it was merely a physical rescue, wasn't it? It was merely an earthly rescue. Yes, they'd escaped from the physical place Egypt, but that didn't guarantee them a place in heaven. The rescue from Egypt is like the rescue we get in A&E at the hospital. A&E can patch me up for a few more years on this planet. A&E can save my life for a few more years here. But A&E can't rescue me in eternity. The rescue from Egypt was great, wasn't it? But it was limited. And the law of Moses, what's the key problem with the law of Moses? What's the key problem with any list of rules? Well, the key problem is, I can't keep them. Few of us, I imagine, can honestly say we have never broken the speed limit. Uh, often our speed just creeps up and we don't notice. And sometimes, frankly, we deliberately push it because we're late and we think we'll get away with it. The Pharisees in Jesus' day, they thought they were pretty good at the law, didn't they? They thought they were pretty good at keeping the law, at obeying the law. And Jesus essentially said, you're kidding yourselves, guys. For example, you're lusting over someone and you think you're doing okay because you're not actually having sex with them. Well, if you think that's keeping the law, you're kidding yourselves. For example, he says to them, you're quietly despising someone and you think you're okay because you're not actually stabbing them with a real knife. Well, if you think that's keeping my law, you are kidding yourselves. Inside, he said to them, inside you're murderers, inside you're adulterers. 
The only reason you're not doing it is either because you can't or because you don't think you'll get away with it. The law is limited, isn't it? Because I find that I may just about be able to keep to the, uh, to the letter of the law, but I can't keep to its spirit. Or to use quite a clever picture that the prophet Ezekiel uses, uh, Ezekiel 36, do look at it later. Um, what is my problem? Well, my problem is I have a heart of stone, not a heart of flesh. I'm hard-hearted, that's why I can't keep the law. Deep down, I don't want to obey all of the law all of the time. I love to do what I love to do. I don't love to do what God wants me to do all the time. I actually love me rather more than I love God. Moses wrote the law on stone tablets But Ezekiel tells me, my heart is every bit as hard as that original stone. And so in that context, verse 16 of chapter 1, isn't this incredible? Verse 16, speaking of the Lord Jesus, out of his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Lots of grace already, says John. Lots of grace already given. Rescue from Egypt. Uh, The law which tells us how to safely live as humans, not as dogs. But now in Jesus we have grace and truth, says John. Grace, God's gift of his son Jesus, who will die in my place and will rescue me in eternity. Truth. Truth, not just written on stone tablets, but truth shown to us in a person. Uh, What does truth look like? What does true living look like? What does true relating to God look like? It looks like Jesus. Uh, And later in John, we learn how he will send that other person of the royal family, God the Holy Spirit, who is called the Spirit of Truth, to live within his people, to transform his people, to give them hearts of flesh instead of hearts of stone. From stone to flesh, the word that gives life. And very briefly, my final heading, seeing, knowing, telling. Uh, John writes, verse 14, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen. We have seen. Verse 18. How have we seen? No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in the closest relationship with the Father, he has made him known. How have we seen? How have we seen? God has revealed himself in Jesus. Why has he done this? So that he may be known, so that we may know God for ourselves. Why has John, our author, or what has John, our author, done with what he has seen? Well, self-evidently, he's written it down for us. He's told us. He's told us so that we might believe and that we might have life. Seeing, knowing, telling. Another John, John the Baptist, what has he done? Seeing, knowing, telling. Isn't that him too? Verse 15, John testified concerning him. He cried out saying, this is the one. And so, you and me and us uh, celebrating Christmas, why will you celebrate Christmas this year? Uh, Maybe you will celebrate because you have seen the unique Christ. Uh, You have seen that only Jesus reveals, only Jesus saves, only Jesus loves like this. Uh, You will celebrate because you've realised you don't need to look anywhere else for revelation. You don't need to look anywhere else for safety. You don't need to look anywhere else for loving security. 
you're celebrating because you've seen that knowing him means believing in him alone. You've seen that Jesus is the light in this very dark world. You've seen that Jesus is someone we can confidently and boldly proclaim. Why will you celebrate Christmas this year? Maybe you will celebrate because you have seen the glory of the one and only Son.